All right, hello everyone. Today we're speaking with Grandmaster Flavio Berry, who has spent the vast majority of his life in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I am just so grateful that you take the time out of his schedule to share some of that history. And um, yes, Grandmaster Flavio, how have you been? Um, you just told me that you have spent the last few months in home. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, going, I'm doing. It's, it's very, it's, it's good. It changed a little bit the way you live yourself, the way that you behave yourself. But because I, I'm used to travel most of my time, but staying at home, I, I, could, I could think about myself a little bit more. And also I have more time to meditate and uh, do exercises, uh, physical exercise and mental exercise, spiritual exercise. So all those things became very well for me. So I... I'm thinking about not traveling so much as I did before. <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> yeah, um, Joan was telling me um, that you go to Belgium for a few months a year. Yeah, uh, I go to Belgium, um, France, Spain, Greece. Uh, what else? Um, uh, oh boy, there are so many places. Oh, you asked for sure, Puerto Rico, and. Um, now, uh, my next trip, I'm going to be going to Cyprus. I have a student over there. He's, uh, he's uh, doing a very well job over there. So I think I'm going to be going there. Okay, good. So, yeah, don't break too many hearts by telling people on air that you won't be seeing them as often. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. Well, but probably, I don't know if it's going to be possible this year. But for sure, next year, I'll be because this is my life. You see, I traveled since I was a boy and uh, I love traveling. I love meeting people, making friends and meeting my friends and uh, teaching. So this is my, that's, that's the thing I love more, most than any, anything else. That's wonderful to hear from, from a teacher uh, that they love teaching. So yeah, it's something, something I aspire to also, great. One reason I want to talk to you was obviously your very storied past. So for listeners that don't know, you started with jiu-jitsu at the tender age of 10, correct? That's right. That's right. 1947. 1947. And yeah. how would you characterize yourself at, as a 10-year-old? Were you hyper-aggressive? Were you hyperactive? No, that's the opposite. I was, I was a weak boy. I had asthma and uh, I was very afraid of uh, physical contact with anyone. And I was afraid of most of the things, afraid, afraid of people, afraid of uh, other boys at school because I, I never knew uh, when my asthma crisis will come up. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, was, I was always afraid of something. Uh, that's why my father took me to Elios Grace's house and tried uh, to to start learning some jiu-jitsu, not just because of uh, the way that I could protect myself or defend myself. It's just a way of doing exercise, not only uh, physical exercise, but mental exercise and psychological exercise. So I could get more, more confident in myself. And how did he, how did your father hear about it and know to send you to Elio Gracie's house? Well, he, he was a close friend of Elio and Carlos Gracie because my father was a journalist mm -hmm. and uh, he worked, he used to work at that time in a huge, the big, the biggest newspaper in Brazil. And, uh, and uh, he had many contacts with uh, many important persons and Carlos and Elio Gracie were very close to him. So he called Elio and said, look, uh, I want to take my, my boy to your house uh, because at that time, Elio was teaching at, at home. He has a, a small room and he has his academy at home. So that, that was my first experience. I, n I never knew what I was going to do there because my father said, I'm going to take you to a, one of my friend's house. He's a jiu-jitsu teacher. I said, what, what is jiu-jitsu? And I, mm -hmm. for me, it was, uh, was impossible to understand. Imagine, no TV, only newspaper and radio's information. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I didn't know anything about fighting, just, just a, uh, 
probably some uh, some comics that uh-huh. I used to read, but not not nothing else. Do you remember your first class? Yes, yes, it was very nice because I met uh, Elio, and I was a small boy, and Elio was a man, so it was big for me, and tall, and uh, and as uh, he got me into the, his dojo and said, take your, your shoes out and come up here. And then I went and said, grab my gi here, my lapel, my, my sleeve. Now put your leg around my leg and make a pressure forward. And this was a sotogari. And then he fall and it uh, uh, was amazing for me. He said, how can I do that? So I was, I was at that moment very, very uh, enthusiastic about uh, being able to do such a thing. And then he said, okay, so this is the first step. Now you're going to learn how to do all the things, self-defense and ground techniques. And, uh, and uh, two days later, I was there again to start my, my classes. But uh, it was not so good because mm. uh, it was not, this was a small room with, a, with a, the time is all over. And uh, that made me feel so, so, uh, so afraid of, having a crisis album and I used to when I got in there uh, see I, I, I could I could so could breathe I couldn't breathe uh-huh. so uh, and but Elio was a was a fantastic teacher and a very very uh, let's say was a, <laughs> a psychologist because mm. he knew how to treat me he knew how to control me to make me feel calm and uh, then I started doing some some techniques and I stood doing this not so often as I should, mm-hmm. but for three years. Okay, so this is a form of claustrophobia, maybe. That's right. That's right. Uh, That's right. Okay, so the first technique you learned in Elio Gracie's Academy was Osotogari. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> was the first one. <laughs> That's so funny, because right? Yes, yeah, it was funny because. Not not an arm bar or things like that. So it was how to uh, to make a takedown with a big man. It was possible. Just just hooking my leg around his leg, pressing back, and he 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 fall. So that that was great because uh, if he showed me a, an arm bar, it would be something probably in my mind. Oh, okay. So and so, but throwing a big man was something very special very special for me about the feelings about the psychological uh, uh, emotions so i felt that i was capable to do something with my body mm-hmm. uh, not the strength but, but my body uh, uh, so that that was a very very interesting way of uh, approaching me to jiu-jitsu so uh, i think that Elio was a very special person but he was a kind of man that used to, when he uh, take any 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 uh, person that wants to learn jiu-jitsu with no knowledge, and he could put a hand in one day, one hour, one, one just one class, a person could do a lot of things, and easily it was so easy for him to teach, and and so easy to person to understand his teaching way. That was amazing, amazing. That's what, that's why I was lucky. Yeah, I mean it's it's such a different model than the you know yeah. modern jiu-jitsu, obviously. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, so curious. So you go in for the first day, you learn osotogari, uh, you say to yourself, "Oh, this is very interesting," and this my instructor is so nice. You come back the second day, and when do you think you felt internal motivation and not, you know, maybe pressure from your dad to go to the class? Was it immediate? No, no, not, not immediate. Because I was afraid going there because of the asthma crisis, mm. not because of jiu-jitsu. And uh, as, as the moment I get into his, uh, his uh, small room, uh, his dojo, I felt that I was going to have a, uh, a crisis. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... Uh, I was not not so enthusiastic about going there because of that, not because of jiu-jitsu. Because jiu-jitsu, I, I, uh, I was always, as he was, uh, has so much, uh, so so deep ability to teach that it was amazing when I could do uh, techniques. And uh, 
So the first three years, so from 10 to 13, I was, uh, I was there because I, uh, my father used to say, to him, you must go, you must go. This is going to be good for you, good for your health. And, uh, but the first, my first day, my first real day that I felt that I was in love with Jiu-Jitsu when, was when uh, Helio Gracie went to my school and invited me and to pick me up and said, okay, now you go with me to my new academy. It's a huge academy in Rio de Janeiro and said, look, now you're going to be start learning Jiu-Jitsu with some instructors. Uh, and then he introduced me to a person that became my instructor, my friend, my brother, João Alberto Barreto. Mm. So this man, he was, uh, and João Alberto was 16 when I was uh, 13, almost 14. So, and then uh, I, I have a straight connection with him. Was uh, because he was a boy. For me, he was a boy. So I said, and he was a strong man, a strong boy. And uh, I, I, he was my model because Elio was a man, was a, a big man, has a, so so, uh, so much uh, things on his life, like fightings. But John Alberto was a boy like me. And, uh, and uh, then I, I said, okay, so this is good. And I start training regularly with him, uh, almost every day. So the first, uh, let's say, the first months, I I used to come uh, three, four times a week. But after f- some months, I became uh, a frequently frequent uh, 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 practitioner, going every day. And most of the time, because I used to study in the morning, so I used to go afternoon until night. I stay all day at the academy going from, from one to another, but staying with John Bertha most of the time. That's why when I was 17, I became uh, an instructor because I was so, so, uh, so uh, enthusiastic and so, uh, so involved on learning mm-hmm. techniques and uh, from, from a person that was a specialist. John Bertha mm-hmm. was a very, very sensitive person. So then uh, I, I identify myself with that. And I believe that uh, some months later, probably when I was almost, uh, I was 14, almost 15, asthma went away. I didn't have mm-hmm. any cries anymore. So it was a miracle because that, that, was, that was what my father was expecting that happened at the Grace, at, at, the, uh, at his Grace's house. But it was a little bit different, but the, 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 the Grace Academy was uh, uh, the, the, the dojos, were were more more open, many windows and things like that. So I, f- I felt much better, and I probably uh, uh, what what's going what's what happened was that uh, one moment I I realized that I, I was I was training, I was uh, doing all all the techniques of self defense and ground, mm-hmm. and I was not feeling anything, even when a person over me mounted on me. That was, should be uh, terrible for a person with uh, with claustrophobia. Mm-hmm. So that uh, then uh, because probably probably I'm sure that I learned how to escape from those techniques, from, from those those pressures. And escaping, I said, if I can escape here, I can escape anywhere, anyway. So uh, asthma would not going to mount on me and submit me anymore. That's fantastic. Inspirational for a lot of people, I'm sure, that have maybe these underlying physical or mental issues. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. And how many other kids were there? Like, was it a group class you were in, or was it more like a private? No, only private classes at that time. Only private classes. Where there were a lot of kids, and uh, most mostly during the day. At night, from seven up, was more uh, adults. Adults. Uh, training together, but uh, all the classes were private for kids, for, for adults, for men and women, all, all, all private. All, I, I believe that some years later, it then started the Gracie Academy, some, uh, some group classes, but at the beginning it was only, only uh, uh, private. Mm. And uh, that was good. For me, it was amazing because I could learn everything so fast, because I was there every day, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, was uh, was amazing. Because as I said, in a few years I was an instructor already, 
knowing all the program, everything from from uh, standing and and ground. And uh, some, I think, as the one that was fourteen, yeah, fourteen, I was able to train with all other kids mm -hmm. from other other teachers like Carson Gracie, Elio Vigio, all the other teachers of the academy. They had they used to have own own students, a group of students. So. Uh, and uh, we used to we used to play each other, and uh, and was uh, that was the moment I thought that I was able to. And another detail that I, I must tell it because it was very important in my life was when uh, one day I was 14 years old, and Carlos Gracie said to me, "Come on, get your gi and come with me." Okay, I didn't know what's going to happen, <laughs> but let's go. And uh, we went to two uh, main newspapers in Rio to answer a challenge. A Japanese came to Brazil. His name was Shimura, not, please, not Kimura, Shimura. And this man came to Brazil and challenged Elio Gracie. And uh, Carlos Gracie said that newspaper, look, if you want to fight with Elio Gracie, you must fight first, you fight Carlson Gracie. And if you win Carlson Gracie, then you fight Elio. But the Japanese uh, kept saying that he wants to fight Elio. Then Carlos Gracie decided to provoke him. And okay, if you don't want to fight Elio or Carlson, you got to fight a 14 years old white belt boy. And if you win him, then you fight Elio. And uh, he bet. Um, was a very very strong amount of money at that time and uh, that he was not going to be able to to beat me i don't know if uh, the japanese got afraid of it because imagine uh betting on a, on a 14 years old boy mm -hmm. uh, white belt or oh, this boy is a uh, is amazing is a superman or is that there is something behind it so uh, the thing was that the japanese never showed I think he flew back to, to Japan and never said anything else. But it was my first experience. And, and it was funny for me because another day, my, my picture was on newspapers, first page newspapers. And I said, man, that's me. <laughs> Imagine. Wow. Uh, oh boy, that's, a, that's great. Then uh, I, I start feeling a little bit different. A, little, no, a lot of difference on my life saying, oh boy, it's a, uh, how can how can those 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 persons Carlos and Elio could trust on my capacity? So I I, should, I, I must be good mm -hmm. because they were not exposed their names uh, doing such such a thing if I, I was not not good. And uh, then I start realizing and I talked many times to to John Beto, my teacher. I said, John Beto, am I so good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. So. Uh, you see, when you train with some some other kids, you you beat most of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you 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 good. But I I for for some I say for more two years, I was I was confident because they used to say that I was good. But my my first uh, <laughs> my first real experience was when I was 16, I was at the academy. Then I used to stay most of the day at the academy. And Elio Gracie said to me, come on, take your gi out. You're gonna represent me against someone that came here to challenge me. And that, that guy was a capoeira guy. And uh, when I got into the, the, the dojo, the man was big. And I said, man, am I going to fight with this guy? Oh boy, I wanna go home, <laughs> I don't wanna be here. <laughs> then. And then I said, okay, you're gonna fight him. And uh, because he's challenged, if you if he beats you, he fights me. So I was so afraid that I submitted the guy in 10 seconds because I jump over the guy and I submitted. And uh, uh, the guy was so, so impressed. With him. And uh, he said, I can't believe what happened. I said, no, what happened? We practice Jiu Jitsu here, man. So I said, well, uh, he surprised me. Okay, do you wanna fight again? I'm going to be, give you a chance. Do whatever with this boy, and he will submit you again. But that, at that moment, psychologically, the other guy was absolutely down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely down. So I could submit him again easily. 
So uh, that moment was the first time after six years practicing that I was really able to do. Uh, and uh, that Jujitsu was absolutely amazing. Transformed completely my life, my, my way of behaving myself, my self-confidence, all those things. And I was, uh, I was uh, looking another day, a picture of me uh, in Rio de Janeiro, number 16. Boy, uh, I was a I was a strong boy, so I didn't I didn't remember that, but I was a strong boy, just because of jiu-jitsu. The only sport he used to practice at that time was jiu-jitsu, but was a, almost a full day practicing. Yeah, I mean, you treated it like a like an athlete would treat it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If and you I, have, and I most of, uh, I'm sorry, I, I most of the, every day, as I used to say, every day at night. Uh, and put uh, most of the fighters, or the further the Vale Tudo fighters, together to uh, to train to fight, and uh, there was a, a big dojo. This was a main dojo at the academy, and he used to do this. Uh, and I used to be invited to go there mm -hmm. to train all those with those fighters. Most most of them strong guys, big guys, and uh, and uh, it was uh, I. I was so good. I could do. I could do. I could fight. I could train, and uh, and I was uh, I, I I overcome all the time. So mm. I see uh, because I I found out that I was able. My jujitsu was good. My knowledge was a deep, deep jujitsu knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I could do it, and I became uh, confident. And uh, since that time, and one year later, I was teaching. It was amazing. <laughs> Quite a rise within the academy and the sport. Um, yeah, that's right. What constituted winning within the gym? Was it, would it be like it is now? Because I've seen some old footage and it looks so different. Like what, what did sparring look like back then? Oh, uh, well, at uh, that time, one thing uh, at, the, at the gym, we used to, our fights were st start standing and go to the ground. Gi or no gi, but we have to stand and we have we have to to uh, to practice takedowns. So to be good on takedowns. So uh, so so all the fights and most of the fights were uh, held by by Elio and Carlos. Look, you're gonna fight, okay? This is the opponent now. So if uh, the fight ends when someone wins. Winning means uh, submitting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the, the fight still is 15, 15 minutes, 20 minutes long. Then it's okay, okay, stop, stop. Uh, rest a little bit, get another, another couple. And, uh, but the main thing, the only thing that comes to uh, all of us mind was submitting. Mm -hmm. We never consider well, the knee on the stomach was knee on the stomach was good. Why? Because we could control a person, get mounted, and submit. Or we could uh, armbar. We could do a lot of things. But uh, uh, so uh, because points came so many yes. years later. But uh, but the first step was that, and uh, uh, most of the, the person that used to train or who fight uh, at night at the Gracie Academy, they were strong. So uh, strong, physically strong, because Elio and uh, and Carlos used to invite people that uh, or say he look up a guy on the on the street and said, look, you look good, you look fire, you look like a fighter, come to my academy, and everybody knew them. So uh, people show the academy if a person could be a good a good fighter, they they prepare a person for fights. If not, okay, that's good, thank you, and. Um, so fighting at the academy was not to prove anything, but to prove that you are growing technically and, and physically, mentally. It's more and more this. It's a, because I, we are not there, oh, I could submit that guy so I'm, I'm better. No, no, because another day that guy could submit me. So uh, uh, the point, what it was important is how can I be better every day? So this is this is the main point. This was the, the main philosophy 
and uh, the concept for Elio and Carlos. So when you're when you're sparring in the gym, you're starting standing, either gi or yeah. no gi. Is anyone ever pulling guard? No, no, no. For uh, uh, was the one thing that may could happen was uh, uh, trying to to put a, a step of foot on the hip and pulling mm -hmm. to start to start uh, 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 sweeping to do something to reverse the situation. Okay, but normally no, it was uh, you go you go to the ground you, you you go to the ground after you throw someone or after you do something that both of you go to the ground, but most of the start standing. No, 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 no pulling. Jump in the guard, I never saw that. For sure, if you have a, a very light, a light uh, fighter, uh, we used to have uh, some fire, some lighter fires, but uh, uh, probably they could do this, but most of it was stepping one foot on the hip, trying to keep the person away, probably for a tomoinage or for some kind of a, a sweep, but most was not to to protect you, or not to put a person inside the guard and control someone. Because what are you gonna do? No points, nothing, so no, no control. Okay, so you have to submit. Mm -hmm. So you have to open. Okay, close guard was good, yes. But how can you submit someone with a closed guard? You have to open your guard. If you want to sweep, you have to open. If you want to bar, you have to open. If you want to choke, you have to move your hips, so you have to open. So why, why close the guard? So my closing guard was something, uh, closing guard was something uh, realistic. For example, if I was, I was uh, not so, so strong against a big guy, okay, if a guy came over me, I would try to put a guard and close the guard to control a little bit and to find out a way to 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 get a submission, but th there's no other reason. Half guard, never. Why? Half guard was was just uh, uh, the way the person is trying to pass your guard, and mm -hmm. you try to hold him to control, but not because half guard was good or not, just because it was uh, intermediary uh, step that mm -hmm. you do from guard to side control. So there's a very different paradigm it's a very different mental model yeah for sure it is it is completely different okay so very different. so you have uh you know kind of a, a cultural understanding within you know uh, at least gracie jiu-jitsu gyms uh were you able to witness the uh and this is kind of um apocryphal at this point but the the rivalry between the Gracie Academy and the uh, Fada Academy. I mean, there, it's been said that there was a match between the two academies and um, Fada was able to win with footlocks. How much of that, I mean, were you able to witness that at all? Or, I mean, were you participating yeah. maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a, I, I saw many of those, those, and I, I had a, once uh, one, one, for me was a train. Was more training than fighting, but I was my responsibility was to fight against the person, and uh, and yes, but it was not a rival. So rivals, well, mm -hmm. they 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 had different approaches, and having different approach approaches, they use to uh, to uh, let's say to meet each other, to uh, to try to 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 train to try to to improve techniques. Mm -hmm. So well, nobody was trying to prove anything that father was better or Edu or, or Gracie were better. No, because both were fantastic. Both were fantastic. So the, the difference was because on the father's academy, the more as were more popular academy and more uh, uh, the Gracie Academy was more sophisticated. Well, well because that's why one, one of the reasons that uh, most of the class were were in, uh, in private classes, but uh, Father Academy was a little bit different. So they used to train, to train. Everyone used to train uh, more than uh, the Grace Academy, because a student come to Grace Academy, 
have a class of 30, 30 minutes class and go back home or, or go to work. And uh, at the Father Academy, they get together and they learn and fight. So they were more used to, to fight. Mm. We were used to fight, yes, but only a specific group that was invited by Elio and Carlos to be there at night to, to train and fight. So this was the point. But no, I found no rivals. Um, I always saw a father uh, as, a, as a fantastic teacher and uh, uh, different approaches. No, also it's all different. They were very good on, on football, for sure. And at that time, it was funny because people used to, to, uh, to avoid not having so much uh, foot locks. Uh, I don't know, I don't know why, but uh, we used to have uh, foot locks and the practice foot locks at the Grace Academy too. But they, they were more specialized on that. They, they, they found many, many ways to, to apply those techniques during a, during a fight. So they were, uh, because of that, there were more, you have to be careful when training with them because they could turn to your foot in any time from, from different, uh, different uh, positions. So, uh, but they, I, what I saw and my respect to, to Father Academy was that they were very good and the father was an excellent, fantastic teacher and leader. Mm, that's great to hear. Um, so it was less a rivalry and more of this um, iron sharpens iron kind of mentality. Yeah, that's right. But ma many persons like to talk about those things. So in the mm. past, we used to, yeah, well, man, that's uh, because there are two different, uh, two uh, different uh, academies, Jiu-Jitsu academies. There are only two. So with the, why don't you, we, we, we get together and fight just to see how, how we are doing. So that's more, we have to learn from someone, someone. Okay, for, for sure. Inside of the Grace Academy, you used to say, okay, we go there to fight and to prove that uh, Gracie are better than the father. Well, but this is natural. When you, when you are a fighter, you always look uh, to do or to prove something. But on my, my point of view, at that time, I was a young boy. So, and then I saw, I used to see those, those, uh, those challenges, more challenges, uh, as, as uh, something to be, to prove uh, which, which students were better. That's just, but for me, after that, I could see that they were so good that we, we don't have anything to prove it, each other, just to join and to take advantage to learn from each other. That's what was my point of view. Mm -hmm. That sounds very healthy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so this, is, this has always been very curious to me. So essentially, the art of jiu-jitsu, as it was taught by uh, Maeda and other um, Japanese practitioners um, in the 19-teens, um, so they were, they were Japanese. However, mm -hmm. this tradition, this art, was being continued, being perpetuated by non-Japanese Brazilians. I know that Brazil has a huge Japanese population. So when Japanese came to Brazil, they must have had some grappling context outside of judo also, and um, you know they must have known something of jiu-jitsu. Was there any kind of absorption of new techniques from this Japanese population that was emerging and growing? Yeah, I get, uh, I'm sure that most jiu-jitsu that we practice in Brazil for sure, they came from a uh, Japanese like Maeda or like uh, uh, like other Japanese that came before Maeda to Brazil. Because uh, uh, I think on the, be the beginning of the 20th century, uh, many Japanese came to Brazil because uh, Brazil was a huge country, still being a huge country, but uh, uh, there are so, so much space, space for, uh, uh, for those Japanese, uh, they uh, and agri agriculture, so they 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 found in São Paulo, mainly São Paulo, interior of São Paulo, so many so much lands that they could uh, plant and and and, and create things again. Uh, some uh, 
uh, like uh, poetry and things like that. So those those person, most of them, they came and they knew some. They knew some of some of uh, uh, jujitsu or judo uh, because both came from the same source. But uh, anyway, and uh, uh, those guys, those persons, uh, some of them, like in the Sao Paulo interior, there are so many, so many good. Uh, Japanese uh, uh, judo and jiu-jitsu teachers because they came with a mentality so everything that we know came from there for sure okay now after that Elio, Elio Gracie was a creative guy and uh, he decided to uh, adapt all the techniques for himself and adapting to himself he found out uh, the same uh, the same technique doing a different way uh, using uh, more leverage and strength uh, things like that so uh, that was the moment the the, the Japanese jiu jitsu uh, start being uh, let's see adjusting adjusted mm -hmm. to uh, a, a new concept of uh, of training and fighting so that's uh, that's why I consider Elio and Carlos a genius because the how much time they had to learn from from the Japanese one year two years three years and mm -hmm. they did what they did man they are crude genius so uh, uh, but the Japanese were the base of all uh, martial arts that we have in Brazil uh, I'm considering the Japanese martial art like uh, judo jiu-jitsu karate so because Aikido, because uh, most of those Japanese they came with a lot, uh, very deep knowledge of those those kind of martial arts. So uh, I think that uh, Elio start making some uh, some change. They had he had uh, some fights uh, with Japanese, and uh, from those fights, not not uh, on the fifties like Kimura Kato. No, I, I'm, sorry, I'm saying this is on the 30s or even 40s. And then he, uh, and for sure, each fight, he learned a lot of things. Not prove it that he was good, but he could have had a chance to learn. And learning that way, he had improved uh, the way he was teaching uh, to a new generation. The Jesus that he learned it and he adapted wow. himself. But uh, I think that I'm sure that the Jesus that we know came from the Japanese, for sure. No, no, no way to escape from that. Nobody, nobody created anything. Adjusted, yes. Adapted, yes. But created, not. Mm, okay. Um, so I, I had spoken to Robert Drysdale uh, a few weeks yeah. ago, and I think you've spoken to him also. Um, and uh you know he said something that at the time uh you know some people said was quite controversial that um there was no innovation in jiu-jitsu until their 90s uh basically this is when uh the ibjjf set about making a competition rule set that was very nuanced you could say and uh that's his position on it do you feel like what what was something that you felt was innovative within jiu-jitsu as you were learning it over the decades like through the 30s 40s 50s okay so uh i can say that each decade in brazil uh, jiu-jitsu uh passed through a different uh oh let's say some some uh, some different moves some change so uh what's going on let's consider the beginning when uh, the japanese arrive in brazil they start teaching jiu-jitsu or judo then the mitsumae that came to brazil he start teaching too and then make a little difference because he, he taught to uh the gracie family and the father's family and some other person but those two were the person that uh, uh made uh uh, Jiu-Jitsu uh, take off in, the, in, uh, in Brazil. So, and on the 40s, in the 40s, there were some uh, changes, uh, challenges. Okay, only challenges, some fights. 
in the 50s. This thought a little bit different because uh, Jiu Jitsu, Gracie Jiu Jitsu became more, uh, start being spread to other practitioners and fighters. So on the 50s, Elio Gracie fought and uh, some of the, the, the Gracie's uh, 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 instructors and teachers fought to against some Japanese like Kimura, like Gato, some other Japanese that came to Brazil. Okay, so at that time, what kind of rules we had? Well, okay, let's go to the to submission. That's, that's the point. No time, no rules. We, uh, okay, if you, if you make a takedown, you, you keep going to the ground and it's, uh, you have to fight on the ground, okay? So that's why, for example, Kato, he was a very, very good uh, 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 throwing techniques. So he threw Edu Gracie sometime, but in one moment he uh, came to the ground and Edu uh, caught him on, on a choke in the guard. So, so that's the 50s. 60s, most of the uh, Gracie Academy circuit went out the academy and opened their own academy. So Carlson Gracie, Edu Vigio, João Alberto, Armando, Many of those guys were start uh, own academies. So those were the 60s and start having some, uh, uh, some let's say, let's consider that more a challenge than, than fights or tournament. Okay, one day, Elio Gracie with John Alberto Barreto, they decided to construct something different because Jiu Jitsu were uh, uh, we're growing so fast with so many different academies, so many different uh, instructors, and uh, so many persons trying to uh, to uh, to fight. I'm talking about sport, and uh, they decided to create the first federation. When they create the first federation on the early 70s, they uh, they put some rules and some rules for graduation too. Because at that time, nobody, everyone could graduate, everyone could give a black belt or doesn't matter because there was no rule since the Federation was, was started. And uh, they, everyone had to uh, graduate person considered the rules that was created and start having many different tournaments. Okay, so th at that moment, uh, you may consider that jiu-jitsu, sport jiu-jitsu became more more uh, attractive. Why? Because it was a competition and every everyone, every academy to promote their name, they went, they went to build some, some champions. They had to have some champions. And at that time, I can, I can assure you that Carlson Gracie became the most important one with a, as a strategist and preparing people for fighting, considering basically the, the, the rules we had. So Carlson was a strategist, training and preparing fighters, uh, considering at the uh, rules point of view. So if a person could fight and could win by a takedown, make two points, that's enough, okay. So then control the fight, yes. But they were very fantastic fighters. So he became, the Carlson Gracie Academy became the most important academy and with the most important fighters at that time. Well, mm. I'm talking about the 70s. Now we go to the 80s. The 80s. Hey, could, could we rewind slightly? So um, 1967 was when the Guanabara Federation was formulated or founded, correct? Yes, I think it was a little bit later. <clears throat> I okay. think it was uh, 71, 70 or 71. Okay. That's one. Uh, okay, but uh, probably they, they start, they start uh, constructing the, the Federation, writing the rules and things like that, um, late, late 60s. So then I saw this very brief newsreel that included Jean Alberto, he said it took him years to put the first 
tournament together in 1973. What was the holdup? Well, uh, the point was that why they create rules? Because there are so many, this was spreading so fast with so many new instructors. They wrote the rules considering how can we educate those persons to know jiu-jitsu correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those, uh, those rules were created on thinking about uh, preserving jiu-jitsu structure and history for, uh, for forever. So to put on those things were difficult because imagine how can you uh, now tell everyone, all the academies, that now you're gonna, if you want to fight, you have to follow the rules. So it was, it was not so easy because uh, I said, okay, but I want, I want to fight. I, I don't have, I, before, no time. From that moment on, there are time, time limit. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone that was prepared to fight no, no time limit has to adapt themselves for time limits. So those things uh, came to change the minds, change the minds instructors mind. So how can I adjust my, my fighter to fight under those rules and with the time limits? And sometimes it was different, uh, two or three rounds. That was different on the beginning. So uh, uh, that's why it was, uh, was a very uh, difficult to put all together because there were, they were rivals at that time. They want, they want to fight each other to prove that X Academy was better than the uh, Y Academy. So uh, uh, I think that was uh, a little bit about 74, 75, that everyone uh, uh, start understanding exactly what that the, the, the Federation means and why. Okay, so people were already adjusted to that but they were discussing rules all the time. Nobody is, a, is a completely satisfied with the rules every, every, all, all the time. Now, mm -hmm. nowadays, people are yeah. discussing rules, but on that, on that time, they, they had, a, I'm talking about all, all martial arts mm -hmm. that became sports, Olympic sport, they discuss rules every year, every time, and they change, they make changes. So. Uh, uh, so uh, on the 70s was, uh, was the, uh, let's say, was the moment that uh, all those things start uh, being discussed before, no discussion. What happened before? Okay, the, the Eddie Grace said, okay, now it has to be that way. It has to be. And so uh, uh, when do you have rules and you have uh, 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 something uh, that is, is written to be respected was mm -hmm. a little bit different. I remember some of the first tournaments. Hedio Gracie uh, used to stay at one table with a microphone, many times saying, uh, talking to the, the referee to correct the points or, or, or say, okay, give two points. This is two points because he was educating everyone, not only mm -hmm. the fighter, but uh, everyone. And uh, uh, so I, I, think I, I saw during those times that this time uh, a lot of uh, complicated uh, com uh, complication that it's not so easy to uh, to put all uh, every everyone with a with a let's say a rules uh, fighting mentality. But as I was talking, as I'm saying about Carlson Gracie, as Carlson Gracie was a person that picked up the rule and said, okay, we're gonna fight this way. So he became so good that everyone has to adapt himself to be good too. So uh, I think that uh, that was the moment that people start understanding. But we had a lack of time between the 70s and the 90s. It was the 80s where a lot of competition and uh, most of the time, Elio Gracie was, uh, has to be a referee because mm. it was, a, let's say, a complicated fight. Two, two top champions with different academies. 
Uh, and so they were rivals. So it was uh, the referee to, to say, okay, this it has to be that way. Well, there are some fights, uh, some fights that uh, fight, let's say black belt, 10 minutes at the end of the fight, there is no submission, even with points. And then he goes, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna he give five more minutes to, to have a decision by submission, okay? But the rule said, if you, if you make points, you win. But he decided not to. So he, he was so, he had so, so much power. And everybody uh, will res respect so much his decision that, okay, oh, well, let's see. So I'm so, talking about the 80s. Yeah, yeah, so he could improvise. <laughs> he could almost improvise yeah. as an official. Um, That's right. Okay, so in in the early seventies, late sixties, what was a what was a common debate that was occurring around these rules? Like, were they saying, you know, we should allow, we shouldn't allow this, we should allow that? Like, what was a common debate? Well, uh, uh, allowing was not the, not the main point. Was uh, considering, uh, for example, uh, let's say. Why you put a knee on the stomach and you, you make two or three points? I don't remember that time how, how much points you have. Why do you do only that instead of a, uh, a knee on the stomach is so important that you have to give the same points that you give if a person past your guard? So that's, that, that was the main discussion. And, uh, and uh, some, uh, for example, most of the things that are not allowed today were allowed that time because uh, the mentality was say, we practice jujitsu. So jujitsu has to be the full thing. Okay, if, uh, if you have someone, you're gonna reverse the technique. If you uh, let come uh, or you have a foot lock, if you let come from outside to inside, it's a foot lock, doesn't matter if, uh, it hurts or not. The other one has to know how to defend or how, how to chat. So those kind of discussion became after, after the, uh, uh, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation uh, was, was, uh, had started. But before, no, no, not much discussion. A little discussion about things, but not if this is possible, this is not possible, mm -hmm. but everything was possible. Uh, all, all techniques, all jiu-jitsu techniques was possible. The only thing was about uh, points. Why you give more points for those, this thing instead of giving more points for that thing. For example, passing guard is so difficult. Why not have uh, more points? Because uh, a person has to fight more than uh, get a, uh, if you mount a person those four points, why not the passing guard was not four point? That was a kind of discussion, but <clears throat> but nothing nothing changed uh, until the, uh, the the Brazilian Federation uh, became. That was uh, on I think it was ninety three ninety four something like that. Yeah, yeah. So if my dates are correct, I think it was ninety four. So if I'm correct about the year, the first rules. It was a single point. It was one point for mount, one point for back control, one point for passing, one point for takedown. Um, is that correct? Yes, I guess so. I don't. I don't. I really don't remember. Okay. Because uh, since uh, since the start, uh, the, the federation start, uh, I moved to Sao Paulo. I was not inside there the federation as anymore. I used to be. Uh, uh, just to, to help, just to discuss. But uh, I moved to Sao Paulo and I stood in Sao Paulo from 71 to 75. So when I came back, many things had changed in I Rio. See. And uh, at that time, uh, Sao Paulo was not a, a, an important state in Brazil uh, with fighters. So mo most of the fighters were from Rio and uh, from Rio State and some come from the northeast of Brazil or some comes from north of Brazil. But from Sao Paulo, at that time, no one, no one. Mm. So Sao Paulo became uh, good on the early 90s. But uh, after, before that, none. And Sao Paulo now, 
it's, it's one of the most important uh, uh, state and 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 uh, competitors. Interesting. But so I, when by the time by the time you came back in 1975, there had already been a lot of rules changes, and that includes say mount is worth four points and back pound yeah. the back mount is worth four. Okay, so they already differentiated that very quickly. Yeah, that's right. That's right because uh, uh, how difficult it is we're well, considering uh, uh, the the main concept on a martial art like jiu jitsu. Is, uh, the first thing is self defense. If you learn self defense, you may learn you may know everything. If you know how to fight, just sport, you you have a you have a lack of knowledge. Okay, because most of the submissions come from self defense. Okay, so the point is that's considered that. So when I said that they were educating, it was uh, to make people understand that a neonus stomach that has some amount of points, it is important to control when you are defending yourself on the street and you throw a person, you put a neonus stomach to still controlling. Mm -hmm. And from there, you go to mount. So this is important. Passing guard was not so important. It was important between fighters. But that self-defense? No, because we had to be good on self on guard. But the person uh, that no no don't do not know jujitsu, what mm -hmm. kind of guard he knows how to do? So we don't have to pass a guard. So mount is important, yes, because it's a full control. Back control is important, yes, because it's a full control. So those things are, are were very important. Reverse was important, yes, why? Because if someone comes over you and you reverse and you sweep a person and put the person down, you get the control. I'm talking about self-defense. Mm -hmm. So those, those was the mentality, the, the concept of uh, creating the, those, those, those rules and put points and the amount of points considering the importance of the, the technique. So then initially, guard passing was not valued very highly. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, it became, became very important when you put two jiu-jitsu practitioners fighting. Then you said, oh, now, he, he to get a side control or to mount, he has to pass the guard. So we have to consider this as important, but not Considering the main the main concept on the beginning, as self defense, but as as a fight as a, as a sport, yes. So that's why it became important. Interesting, and I mean this is such a, a big question. Um, when did you start seeing the sportive aspect start changing gym culture? Ah, uh, that was. Uh, I, I believe it was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, and 90s exploded. Because uh, uh, there are so many, so many different academies, both many Brazilian fighters and, 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 and instructors moved to the US. So they, they started opening academies. And uh, the, it was, uh, that's a, let me say, this is my point of view. It's easier, easier to have a gym open for training, you see, so to train, to practice sport, you see, so then to teach the whole thing, you see, so concept of like a much art. Mm -hmm. So to put two persons to roll together is easy. If you want to have a class, let's say, let's consider that a class, a person that knows how to show techniques, not to teach, but to show techniques, he show a technique and ask everyone to repeat it. And they start rolling and start doing that. Now teaching is different because you have to, to know why, first of all, why I'm doing this? Why this position is important to be done this way? Why a choke you have to do this? And why is an arm bar? What is the leverage, the main leverage point? Leverage point. So those points are different. So this is not for instructor. This is for a teacher, mm -hmm. a professor. So uh, uh, 
then it's uh, every every place in the in the in Brazil, you had uh, I say I say only in Copacabana, in Rio de Janeiro, there are probably a hundred academies. I'm talking about the 80s. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then became a thousand academies. Only one neighborhood. Yeah. When I when I started the first academy in Barra da Tijuca, there was another neighborhood. My first was a, a early a late 70s. There were no academy in Barra. Now there's a thousand academies over there. So, uh, uh, since the moment people were preparing, uh, uh, say, practitioners to be fighters. First, because it was easier, and second, because he wanted to promote his academy, having more champions, more medals, and uh, by consequence, having more uh, attraction for his uh, name and his brand. That point, all the martial art was put aside and became only only sport. So this is the this is my point of view, and. I, I consider that if you if you want to change jujitsu, you have to hold the full thing, the, the whole techniques, mm -hmm. techniques that come from standing. Okay, now pulling guard, man, what can start a fight sitting on the ground? What kind of fight is that? <laughs> well, now now it's a jiu-jitsu fight. That's what, but 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 this is not much hard. This is for fun. This is for play. Okay, if you want to play, but you have to have a mat. Now, go to the street and sit on the ground and ask someone to come over you. They're going to kill you. Oh, come on. So that's, a, that's, that's a, the point that changed the mentality and the approach and the way of, uh, of uh, showing techniques. Okay, or the jiu -jitsu, sport jiu-jitsu became so, uh, I'll say, so modern modern that considering that uh, it has so many uh, adjustments and adapted. There are some persons that ask me, okay, uh, uh, and how about the evolution? Evolution? No, I don't consider that evolution. This was adjusted because the rule said that if you do this, you make points. If you do that, you're gonna make points. So, come on. Okay, so sweeping became so important because you can win a fight by a sweep. Mm -hmm. So, why? Why? It's a so you prepare a student or a fighter, not a student, but you prepare a student to to to, to sweep. Now tell me, on the real life, what kind of sweep you're gonna do? So, so this is this is a point. I'm not old fashioned and I'm not old school. I love to see people teaching uh, to uh, fighting. But I don't like rules. Those hmm. rules I don't like. That's my point. I don't like because why? Because there's a distortion. Jiu Jitsu is not the same. And we are coming, we are putting Jiu Jitsu on a track that in a few years the much art was gonna be forgot. Hmm. Strong words. <laughs> um, so so, I mean, this is curious also. So in the first footage I ever saw of a jiu-jitsu tournament, um, there is zero guard pulling. Yeah. Uh, when did guard pulling become, so it was essentially allowed. It would not penalize the guard puller. Yeah, I, I guess so. As I said, you, uh, it was a lack of time, or my time in, in Rio <clears throat> for tournaments during 71 to 75. So I think it was during that time uh, uh, what happened. Uh, there were so many, so many good fighters using guard and using the guard strategy that passing guard should be pointed because it, uh, it was a very, very hard and a specific way of training. So I believe that that was the moment that someone, someone realized it's okay. So let's, uh, let's do, let's put a, some points. I don't remember if it was three, but it was something around that because it was very, very hard. Very, now very you, good, very good uh, person controlling with the guards. So it's, uh, 
And uh, if you get inside of a guard, what's happened? So you have, you have to move out because what kind of submission are you gonna have there? So you have to move out. So what kind of strategy I do have to have to, uh, to, to, to pass a guard? So it's, it's difficult, yes. So let's consider that a, a very important, uh, 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 let's say, uh, way of uh, making, uh, winning a fight. Because passing a guard is supposed to be winning a defense. Okay? Yes. Going over a defense. So if I, if I could pass a guard of a good person, a good, a good practitioner, a fighter with a good guard, I, uh, it was the most uh, winning a fight. But then, uh, what happened? <laughs> you, 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 get, uh, you get there, now you control, side control, uh, and win a fight. I, if I was a fighter at that time, having a medal, winning a fight with points, I would not accept it. Hmm. So that rule change, I mean, that's, a, that's a huge difference then from the previous incarnation of Jiu-Jitsu, right? That now all of a sudden, yes, you can pull guard. Yes, it is a viable strategy to win a match. And, um, you know, now it's, you know, most people now in, in competition are pulling guard. And, you know, it could be argued rightfully so because the points uh, award them so much. Uh, there's so many incentives for them to want to pull guard. So that to me is like a, a really huge step to take in one way or the other. Yeah, could you repeat, please? I have an interruption here. Oh, I said, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, oh, I, I said it was a, to me, it's a huge step to take in one way or the other that we mm -hmm. allow guard pulling as a viable strategy. So you think that occurred in the early 70s still? Like, so when you came back to Rio in 1975, people were jumping guard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when, uh, for example, my son Marcelo was, uh, was uh, a good for a standing fighter. So because he practiced judo with a sensei, Josh maybe, and uh, he was good on takedown. So most of the fighters that used to fight against him knew that he was going to be two points on a, on a takedown. Mm -hmm. So what is the strategy? Jump on the guard. Jump and pull the guard. Or not sitting, but just jumping. Because that was a way of avoid not being thrown. Mm. So, this, uh, so, so this was uh, the point. And on the beginning, for example, here in Sao Paulo, on the early 90s, uh, there were many, many uh, judo practitioners that uh, start training jiu-jitsu and start fighting jiu-jitsu tournaments. And there was another reason to pull the guard and jump on the guard, jump to pull the guard because those judo guys, they could throw anyone. So, and throwing, I remember I had, I had a, one Japanese, uh, uh, Brazilian Japanese guy, uh, on my academy here in Sao Paulo. And uh, I put him to fight a tournament. And he won, uh, I don't know how many fights, only with takedowns. Only with takedowns. He, he stood standing all the time. And uh, the person tried to, to jump, he was ready for another takedown. So two points, two points, two points, and win the fight. So. That's why on one moment, I think that many fighters, many strategists, academy and then say, guys, okay, don't go. Don't fight against that guy. He's going to make two points against you and probably you're going to lose the fight. So let's, let's jump and, uh, and let's start that way. I think that that was the moment that doing that was, uh, was interesting, was important to prevent not being true. Because the, I, 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 I practiced judo for a long time and, uh, and I compete on judo too. And uh, one thing that uh, I know is that someone that knows that you, I remember many fights in here in Sao, in Sao Paulo. And the guy said, okay, be careful because this guy is a judo guy. So what are gonna, what are going to do? Well, jump, jump because he's going to throw you. 
And many times, at that time, what happened? When you jump, the person lose the balance and slam you on the ground. Oh. That, yeah, and then became, uh, 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 let's say, forbidden because of that. Not just because a person slammed you on the ground, but because you lose, lose balance and fall forward, slamming you on the, on the ground. And, uh, and uh, became dangerous, and it is uh, dangerous. But before, we never, I, I'm, I'm talking about all the time, since the early 50s to the 90s, no, nobody had, during a tournament had any kind of, a, of a, a, a spine problem or cervical problem being slammed on the ground. But into the academies, yes. Mm. So what happened? They, it was uh, uh, forbidden. You could not do that because, so forget it. It doesn't exist anymore in Jiu-Jitsu. So that's yeah. why, that's why, like a cervical uh, technique. Mm -hmm. It was forbidden because it was so, so dramatic, the consequence mm -hmm. that was forbidden. Interesting. So it changed, it changed uh, the training culture within gyms. That's sure. Sure. And the rules changed completely, the cultures. So it's completely, completely. That's a, because if you, if you want to practice sport jiu-jitsu, the first thing you do, no, let's consider it not sport jiu-jitsu, but let's consider it, I'm going to the academy just to have fun. Okay, I'm going to be rolling there, sweating, and have fun. Okay, that's good. Now, I'm there because I like, I like uh, to, to fight. Then I have to follow the rules. Okay, the first thing that your, your coach is gonna say, okay, the guys decided to sweep, sweep, sweep. Why do I sweep? Because I make two points. No, the concept is different. I sweep because I want to reverse the situation. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main concept. I want to reverse the situation. I don't want anybody over me. I want to, I want to be over a person. I want to be with a control, full control, with my pressure. So uh, I think that's uh, most of the, the, the gyms all over the world, they practice uh, sports or Jesus uh, following rules. And this is what, what makes Jiu Jitsu uh, 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 real Jiu Jitsu. There's no rule. I say, well, boy, but you have to, oh, for fighting, yes, but the, in the, the academy, let's do whatever, let's do everything. Because you have to learn. You have to learn to avoid not being there. The main thing is, for example, you're good on footlocks. Okay, if I train with you or I fight with you, I have to be. Good, avoid not you. I, uh, you be able to see because I, I must I must prepare myself to fight against what is the risk for me. So, okay, so this is uh, interesting because it's a little bit yes. different of, of fighting for rules. Oh, I cannot be stupid because it makes two points. No, I cannot be stupid because this guy come over me and can submit me. Mm -hmm. Gonna make pressure over me, or punch me in the head. <laughs> That's right. Oh yeah. Now you're talking about reality. That's the point, for sure. Oh no, you you said about this is very important. Let's consider it, uh, uh, no rules fights. If someone come to you and try to attack you, you put you pull, uh, put the guard. Guard is protection. But the guy went inside of your legs, so inside of your guard. What do you do? You close your guard. If you close your guard, you pull the guy towards you and he's gonna punch you. Mm. You put your feet, you put your feet on the hip and make the guy move the guy back. I don't want him over punching my face. That those things make the difference. Okay, instead of a pulling the person towards me that he's gonna be able 
to execute me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull him away, push him away, or pull him because I don't want him over. Then I want to, I want to reverse to be able to be over and to have the control. If someone has to punch at me, not, not the other one. Hmm. I'm talking yeah, about reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is, you know, I, to some extent, I think all of us at any level uh, as practitioners, we all want to believe that what we're learning can be applied um, to a self-defense situation. And um, we've been exposed to a lot of different angles to this. So, you know, I feel like many people would understand the concept you're talking about, even though day to day they train it. I mean, they almost never train it. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a very different uh, training methodology. Um, I'm going to do one last question and then, yes. Uh, and then I'll, uh, have to uh, maybe I uh, maybe have to touch base with you again because I'm it's like <laughs> I, I had a, a few friends like email me and send me some questions I still have two pages of questions here um, oh, but uh, <laughs> um, when was to in your mind neon belly invented oh neon belly was the one of the first thing that was uh, put on on the rules jiu-jitsu rules on the early 70s because of the importance of near the valley control. Mm -hmm. If you, like I say, if you have a, a real fight on the street and you defend yourself, make a takedown, how do you control? The first control you do, you jump for month immediately. No, put a knee on the stomach, knee on the valley. Then you have the full. Have two different points here. First, you have the control. Second, because considering that your opponent on the street do not know jiu-jitsu. So that's the first one, the other stomach. And then you have a full 360 uh, angle to see around if someone is coming. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So this is a very important part of real jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I mean, it's, and Robert Drysdale made a very good point. That is, a very quintessentially uh, jiu-jitsu position. It doesn't exist in judo. Um, so you could say that was a piece of positional innovation that occurred. Yeah. Do, you know, do you remember when you first learned Neon Belly? Yeah, well, early on the, on the 50s, in the 50s we used to do this because as we pass the guard and the person is trying to escape or trying to, to move out, the first thing was to, to control, control the, the collar and lapel behind the neck, control the pants and move your knee towards uh, the belly. Because from there, you have a chance to get mounted. So those, uh, those things were early, early. So we used to do this because it was part of, a, part of, of the uh, strategy, uh, not only to control, but I saw I saw some uh, Bali to the fights. If I remember, was uh, I don't know who, but I think it was Jean Alberto. He uh, made a takedown of a guy who was on the ground and he moved the knee on the stomach and then slide slide in to to a mounted position. Mm -hmm. But the first thing was the knee, because if the guy tried to escape, he was there standing. Instead mm -hmm. of going straight to mount, and a, a person could block his uh, his leg, not allowing him to mount, and he was going to lose a chance. So the first step was near the stomach. Well, now I can control. Yes, now I go to mount. Interesting. So something as as uh, important as quintessential as the neon belly existed very early on in in Brazilian jiu-jitsu or Gracie jiu-jitsu. That's right. That's right. That's right.